Continue our discussion of the circulatory system with the cardiac auscultation. In this setting, we're going to be looking at utilizing the bell and the diaphragm for cardiac auscultation. Notice on our anatomical structure of the chest, we want to start out with listening at the aortic listening pulse, which is at the second intercostal space, just to the, the right of the sternum. Once we have auscultated for murmurs, for thrills, for gallops, we then move to the pulmonic listening post, which is at about the third intercostal space to the fourth intercostal space on the left-hand side of the sternum. We then move to the tricuspid listening post, which is at the fifth intercostal space just to the left of the sternum. Finishing off our diaphragm examination with the mitral valve listening post, which is at the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. We'll now move to doing these assessments on our live patient. Starting again with our diaphragm, just to the right of the sternum, second intercostal space, and auscultating. This is the aortic listening post. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about auscultating for carotid bruits, and this is going to be one of those situations is if you hear a murmur that's relatively loud and are concerned if it transmits, being thinking about aortic stenosis or aortic insufficiency, we will then move superior to this position to auscultate for carotid bruits. From this point, though, in this examination, we're going to move next down to the pulmonic, which is in about the third to fourth intercostal space to the left of the sternum, auscultating and rating on a one to six for any murmurs, listening for gallops or rubs, moving then down to the fifth intercostal space just to the left of the sternum, remembering that if you're dealing with a female patient that has large breasts, you may have to ask them to displace some of their breast tissue with their hand. The final auscultatory place is at the fifth intercostal space mid-clavicular line. In this case, I will ask my patient to lift her left breast slightly. I will then place on the mid-clavicular line with my diaphragm to auscultate from my mitral valve listening post. Once you've assessed here, you then take your stethoscope, flip it over so that you have activated your bell. In this case, we will then go back to the tricuspid listening post asking the patient to lift her breast, going down to the fifth intercostal space in the mid-clavicular line for the bell auscultation of the mitral valve post. This concludes the bell and diaphragm examination for cardiac tones. For auscultation of carotid bruits, especially in a situation where you've auscultated over the aortic listening post and you have heard a significant murmur, what you can do is make sure that your stethoscope is set up for your diaphragm. You can have the patient turn their head slightly away from you, and what you want is the space in between the sternocleidomastoid and the trachea. You're going to gently place your stethoscope on that area, remembering not to press too hard because you don't want to massage the carotid. Tell the person to take a breath and hold their breath while you listen. The reason that we do this is because very often a soft brewy which is created by narrowing or stenosis in the carotid artery, can be obliterated by a person's respiratory effort. You will then go to the other side, having the patient turn their head slightly towards you, find again the sternocleidomastoid, going just medially to that, gentle pressure, remembering we do not want to massage the carotid, asking the person to take a deep breath, having them hold their breath, and then auscultating for the carotid brewing. Remember with carotid bruises and stenosis, to be able to create the turbulence that creates the sound you are auscultating for, there needs to be adequate obstruction. So in some situations where there may be still some bit of obstruction, but maybe not enough to cause the turbulence, or there may be too much. So if you are concerned, doing a carotid ultrasound is your gold standard for this testing. Once you have done your cardiac auscultation, you want to also remember to do your cardiac inspection and palpation. You're going to start out because you've just auscultated your listening posts. Again, making sure that you've washed your hands before the examination. 
second intercostal space just to the side of the sternum and palpating the aortic area. You're then going to move to the third intercostal space. In some texts, you will see reference to the second intercostal space, but just as long as you're in this general area for palpating in between the ribs, remembering that you cannot palpate cardiac function through a rib. So you're gonna pal palpate here over the tricuspid, then moving down to the pulmonic, again, dealing with breast tissue, but remember you have to feel in between the ribs. Once you've done that, you're gonna ask the patient to slightly lift up their breast because you've done the aortic, their tricuspid, the pulmonic, and finally the mitral valve, again, going in between the ribs. In this situation too, you can then move your hand across the ribs because this is also where you're gonna feel for the palpation of the apex of the heart, feeling for any thrills, heaves, or lifts. You're also gonna palpate for these three items over your other previously done listening posts. Our final part of our examination for, carotid, for cardiac inspection and palpation is going to be inspection of the jugular vein for jugular vein distension. By having the patient at approximately 30 to 45 degrees elevation, we then assess at the patient's jugular vein on both sides. If you'll notice, this person doesn't have any significant distensions, but if you look carefully right at my fingertip, you can see the subtle pulsation. If this actually had any kind of, right through here, if they had any kind of engorgement in situations like severe lung disease, interstitial lung disease, cardiac tamponade, congestive heart failure, you would be able to see a significantly more prominent, and I can demonstrate that by occluding above the vessel. You can see that now there is a slight fullness of the vessel once I've occluded from a superior angle. If they did have jugular venous distension, we would take from the sternal angle, drawing a plane straight back. However hot, how height this is at the sternal angle, if I can see from the side here, the height that would be from the sternal angle here would then have five centimeters added to it in order to estimate the jugular venous pressure. Remembering that the more full and the higher the jugular venous pulsation is, the greater the intrathoracic concern.